Uh, my name is Barbara Kivowitz, and I am a clinical social worker and a healthcare innovation consultant and an author. And um, out of my own illness experience and becoming aware of how important my relationship was with my primary caregiver, my husband, and realizing that there are no resources out there uh, that helped us understand how illness affects that relationship between patient and caregiver and what we can do to stay strong. We did a lot of interviews and research and, and wrote, wrote this book, Love in the Time of Chronic Illness, How to Fight the Sickness and Not Each Other. Um, and writing the book and hearing all these stories, poignant, honest stories of how people move through their illness journey um, was not only a transformative experience for me, but one of the things I learned, perhaps the most important thing I learned, is that illness takes so much from us. Yet, many of the people we spoke to said, and it was my experience too, there's nothing like the power of illness, the, the urgency, the fraughtness, the life or deathness of illness, um, to cut through the, the noise and the irrelevancies of quibbles and everyday life and habits and routines and illuminate for us what really matters. And ultimately what really matters um, is the people we love and being with them and, and having compassion for them and for ourselves. And that's, if there is a gift in illness, um, it's a gift we have to search for sometimes, but it's a powerful gift that can last a lifetime. And like most people who fall into things, it happened from my own personal experience. But my this is deeply appreciating that when one goes through a serious illness experience, you're never standing alone. Um, you are, whether they're physically present or even when they're, if they're still alive, you are surrounded by a, a social network. And usually the person who is at the center of your social network is your primary caregiver. For me, that was my husband. Mm -hmm. So when I went through my illness experience, um, I was stunned by how profound an impact it had on our relation, on every aspect of our relationship. You know, from the kitchen to the bathroom to the bedroom to the front steps. Everything was affected. And like a good intellectual, you know, I started looking for material, for research that would help me understand and maybe even provide kind of a bit of a road map so that I would feel a little bit of control over my experience. Uh, and there was nothing. There was nothing. So uh, as I was getting better, a colleague of mine and I decided that we were going to write the book that we wish we would have had during our illness experiences. So we interviewed many, many, many patients and caregivers and couples and surviving partners and experts from a whole range of disciplines to find out how does illness affect the relationship between the patient and caregiver. What can they do to, um, to be as strong and resilient as possible? Because a strong and resilient relationship foundation um, helps you get through. It helps you get through the day to day. It helps you make decisions. It helps you feel safe. And it helps you on the other side, whatever your other side is. Um, so we wanted to know what couples and other patient caregivers did. How did they do it? And more recently, I've become very interested in what healthcare providers and hospitals and healthcare organizations can do to not just be patient-centered, um, but to be family-centered, which doesn't mean just knowing the names of everybody in the family and shaking their hands when they walk in the room. It means really seeing the, the, the focus of treatment as being the patient and the person or the people who are most important to her, 
that's where healthcare systems and providers can really achieve, I believe, and what we've been learning um, to be uh, true, that's where they can achieve the, not just the best health outcomes, but more enduring health outcomes. I think that there are common issues that come up, and that's one of the things that we saw, and it was, it was interesting when we were interviewing for the book, so many different kinds of combinations of patients and caregivers, is that there are common commonalities and common themes that appear. So, so one of them is what I was describing earlier, is that their experiences of the illness is different. And if they don't recognize that, they're going to they're gonna collide instead of connecting. You know, the, the patient may want the quiet time, the caregiver may want to problem solve. So she, they um, go into a room and close the door, the caregiver sees this as a danger signal that something's wrong, goes into the room, honey, what's wrong, what can I do, and they collide. That's one. Another one is that the roles change in the relationship. You go from a partnership of equals to one of patient and caregiver. Um, and that can be a game changer. Uh, for some partners, uh, that becomes so embedded and, and prolonged over time that they lose their adult intimate connection, whether that's a couple or, or a mother and daughter. Um, it, it, it mutates into just being patient and caregiver. And you, you miss out on a lot. And hopefully when the patient recovers, it becomes really hard to um, resurrect that adult connected relationship. That's the second issue. Another, another issue is, is what I call the protection racket, where neither one wants to say anything that would hurt the other one. And they assume that if they were to speak about what's, what's in their gut and their heart, to speak about their emotions, whether that's fear or anger or frustration, um, that, that it might somehow cause harm and cause damage or break things. So what winds up happening is that each person is, is roiling with their own inner experience and, if, and not talking about it. So what they talk about winds up being a little bit more superficial and their connection winds up being a little bit more um, fragile mm -hmm. at a time when they really need each other the most. Ultimately, the patient has the ultimate control. It's, it's the patient's body. So that person uh, ultimately is the decider about what treatment direction um, and whether to continue treatment or not. That's very hard for the caregiver, um, almost impossible, because uh, more than anything, they want to make it better and they want to save you. Um, and if you're making choices that they don't agree with or they don't think that the choices are on the path to you getting better, um, that's, that's an almost unendurable dilemma for them because they, they know that the caregiver knows that he or she has to respect that it's your body, your life, ultimately your choices. At the same time, they want you to do it their way. Um, that can be a really kind of head-butting, um, endless loop <laughs> that, the, that the patient and the caregiver could get into. Um, and I think it's important to recognize when that loop gets activated, take a breath and instead of trying to persuade and convince, ask and listen. Ask the, each other. And it's not just the caregiver asking the patient, it's the patient asking the caregiver. Asking, tell me, tell me your experience right now. Tell me tell me what's going on in your mind and your heart that's leading you to want this. Um, and to try and listen with as much of that, of that foundational compassion and love that you can muster. Mm -hmm. And ask questions for the purpose of understanding. The medical system is overwhelming. 
Um, and it's structured, and this is not, it's not a criticism, <clears throat> but it is. <laughs> but but uh, they're trying as hard as they can, and they're scarce resources, and they're overwhelmed, and the payment structure is crazy. Um, and the doctors and the nurses and the clinicians are dedicated and doing everything they can do, but the system is very broken. And one of the ways it's broken is it's segmented. Um, you know, you may have cancer and diabetes, and you have to deal with two completely separate stovepipes. Um, and each stovepipe has its own systems and rules and complications. And it's bigger than one person can deal with. So I think you, you, act, you work as a team. You have to work as a team. You have to go to appointments together, do your homework beforehand. Um, maybe one person does internet research and another person makes phone calls. Um, do your homework, come up with the questions you want to ask. When you see your doctor as a team, make sure that each of you has your chance to ask your questions. Um, make sure that each of you understands exactly what is, what is the information and what are the implications of the information that you're getting from the doctor. Um, and don't feel pressured and support each other in not feeling pressured to make decisions on the spot. Um, you may need time. Uh, you may need to get more information. You may want to consult another uh, clinician. And in the moment, it could feel like you have to decide right now or else. But it's, it's rarely or else. And, and use each other and check in with each other around, um, are we ready to take next steps? Are we clear about what these next steps should be? So really work as a team. Rely on each other's competencies, your areas of, of strength, and um, combine them. So one of the big differences between the patient and the caregiver is that they're experiencing the illness differently. It doesn't mean the same thing to each of them. So the patient is experiencing it in, in their body. And um, for them, it can be a profound existential crisis. They, they were one thing. They don't know exactly who they are right now. And they don't know who they're going to be. Um, so the patient uh, may need some quiet time, some alone time to process and, and wrestle with, with all these new forces in their life. Uh, for the caregiver, the experience is very different. Um, they're sweetie, they're, they're, they're the person, one of the people they love most, um, is at risk. Uh, they are driven to problem solve. They want to make it better. They want to do. Um, and uh, that can be another potential point of, of collision. In addition, when, when the two of them, if they show up for a doctor's appointment together, the doctor will ask the patient what's going on, how are things going, and the patient, who often wants to present good news to the doctor, uh, will say, oh, since the last visit, I'm doing pretty well, um, I'm, uh, I'm sleeping, you know, the medication is really helping, and, and the caregiver may be sitting there, you know, looking to the side, looking at the ceiling, um, bouncing their leg, it's indicating that there's something different going on than what the patient is saying. Mm -hmm. Many doctors will ignore that. Mm -hmm. Part of the work that I'm trying to do with providers and with the healthcare system is to teach them not to ignore that. that that's vital information. Um, and if they were to ask the caregiver what Tell me what's, you look, you look a little um, like you're trying to say something. Tell me what it is. The caregiver may say, oh, that's not, that's not what's going on. She's not, you know, the, the patient is not sleeping. The patient is, um, was in much more pain this week and, and wasn't even taking the medication as prescribed. So what's going on there? Is one right and the other wrong? No. It's that their experience of the illness is very different. And what's driving that experience is very different. Um, and the patient is experiencing it in her body, 
and the caregiver is experiencing it in their in their perspective, in their in their vision, and in their sensing, and they may be focusing on, on very different things, um, and both need validation, and both need to emerge in in a treatment context so that the doctor could have the full picture. What I would suggest is that I would give them another job to do, so to speak. In addition to doing, I would suggest that they dedicate some time to being. And being means literally that. It means just being by the side of your, your beloved, your sweetie, your, 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 your friend, um, in the moment, uh, doing nothing practical and breathing together and holding hands and watching a silly movie, if you can, or talking about how you're each feeling. Because the being, <clears throat> the being will ultimately be what really matters. It won't matter that you got the laundry done and ironed the sheets. Nobody irons sheets, but it won't matter. Um, what will matter is that uh, you spent those hours and, or those days side by side having, having elevated or low or silly or significant conversations. Um, and in addition, part of what fuels the, the endlessness of the doing uh, are emotions. Emotions that often the caregiver doesn't feel he or she can express because their emotions, if, they, if there were words attached to them, the words would say things like, I'm afraid. Um, I don't want to lose you. Uh, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help you. Um, I'm, I'm angry at the fact that you have this disease. Even I'm angry at you for getting sick. And all these things feel like they're forbidden. You can't speak them out loud. So they convert into fuel for continuing to do good deeds. And, and that's endless. And the, the, the benefit of just being is it gives those feelings a place to settle. Even if they're never expressed, it still gives them a, a, a quiet moment to to rest instead of churning. Notice what's going on, name it out loud, and, um, and speak from, from your mind and your heart, and listen from your mind and your heart. Ultimately, being the one who has the illness in your body, there's an inevitable gap, and it can be it can be shared up to a point, but there's a part of it that, um, that is between you and your, whatever you want to call it, you and your soul, you and your spirit, you and your, your inner being. Um, and as much as you can talk about it, and even as much as you can journal about it, there's a part of it that, um, that's not available. Um, for connection. But that's not necessarily torture, <laughs> and it's not necessarily bad. Um, it's a human experience. And I think if, if we can go to that place and, and breathe in it and sit in it, um, that's a, a crucial and a significant life lesson, life experience, because there is a moment when we're all alone. And it can be overwhelming and terrifying, but it doesn't always have to be. A critical ingredient that we need th throughout our lives, in all circumstances, is, is hope. And hope can exist and persist even when a cure is not possible. You can attach hope to anything. And I want to read 
what this one man said about, about hope. He suffers from a uh, neurological disorder and has been on the doorstep of severe health crises many, many times. And here's what he said about hope. There's always something to be hopeful about, no matter what condition you're in. When you have your health, you can be hopeful about having any of your dreams come true. Once your body fails you, you can rest your hope in your emotions. You can hope that you will still feel love and compassion for others and for yourself. If your emotions become emptied, you still have your spirit. And you can hope to connect to something greater than yourself something that has a light to shine on your shadows. And when the spirit is gone, then you have already become something else, and who knows what hope awaits you there.